Hey everybody, we want to thank you for taking in an online service with us. And we have prayed through everything that you're going to see here. My only request for you is that this in no way would replace your Sunday gathering with a church family in a church somewhere. I would just ask that this would be in addition to your regular getting together at church with a church family. And with that being said, we hope that this message blesses you and that if there's anything you need, you feel free to reach out to us. Enjoy the message. Good morning, everyone. Glad that you're all here. I'm going to let you make your way to your seats so we can get started. I'm Pastor Bob. All right, all right, all right. Uh, yes. Well, welcome to Revolution Church. So glad that you are here today. If you are new with us, in the seat in front of you, there are these connection cards. Please fill that out. Let us know that you are here. You can drop that off at the connection table. If you have questions or if you have prayer requests or if you'd like to get involved in anything, please mark that as well on your connection card and drop it off at the back table. Real quick, like, this is kind of a funny story. Yesterday, Pastor Billy and I, we always go through the announcements on Saturday and we're like, okay, we added everything to it. And he's like, nope, there's three. And I go, no, we added everything to it. And then this morning during worship, I just remembered what it was. So we're gonna pause here. And I just wanna really quick, like, um, we have ministry highlights every so often. And we just wanna highlight people that are serving. And so um, Tammy brought to mention, you know, somebody that might have been overlooked. And I feel really bad about that. So I wanna apologize first for maybe not recognizing as much as I should. But um, Bruce, Bruce is our camera guy. And he has been doing this since the very first day. Thank you, Dr. Bruce for your faithful service so that when we miss church, we are able to still be able to watch it. And then the other person I want to mention is Larry Click. He serves and brings us coffee and he comes in early all the time and make sure that we have hot coffee afterwards he's washing dishes and i don't know if anybody knows this he also serves in our kids area so he is a stellar volunteer want to say thank you thank you for doing that we appreciate you thank you tammy for bringing those up to appreciate that this coming Thursday, we have small group at Miss Brenda's house, 6.30 p.m. This is a topical uh, small group, so there's not a Bible study that you have to be prepared for, that you have to get your homework done for, or anything like that. We just come, we have fellowship, we dig into the Word of God and see what it says. We don't get to change that, by the way, if anybody knows that. If we don't like it, we have to deal with that. But uh, Pastor Billy always brings us the truth on Thursday um, evening, 6.30 p.m. If you need directions, Miss Brenda, can you wave your hand? She can give you directions to your to your, her house. Thank you, Miss Brenda, for hosting. <clears throat> and make sure you have this on your calendar for next Sunday. Next Sunday, March 17th, we have stone soup. Can everybody say next week? So because it's next week, this is your last week to sign up. Please let us know that you're coming. It is a potluck as well. Please let us know what you are bringing. I did see there's lots of spots open. So if you haven't signed up to bring something, make sure you mark that. Um, it's a great time. It's a great time of being able to just not rush out of here, but to be able to have food and fellowship and hang out. So make sure you mark that and make sure you stop by the connection table to sign up. And then the following Wednesday, March 20th at noon here at the Church of Seniors have their St. Patrick's Day luncheon. And that too is a potluck. So you'll want to make sure to sign up to come and as well sign up to what to bring. And um, if you have questions about that, you can talk to Kathy Felchlin. And super exciting. We've got so many awesome things going on. Mark your calendars. You're not going to want to miss this. Good Friday service, March 29th, 7 p.m., it is amazing. It is not kid friendly, I'll just say that. So you want to be careful with that and choose whether or not you want to bring your kids. But um, Friday night, 20, the March 29th, 7 p.m., Good Friday service. And then Easter Sunday, March 31st, 10 a.m., invite your friends. People are more open to invitations on Christmas and Easter. So think of who you might want to invite for Easter Sunday. 
And then beginning Sunday, April 7th, 6.30 p.m., it'll be here at the church. Pastor Billy is going to be starting to teach some classes. So he's going to be teaching biblical theology and some psychology and some, some just awesome things. So there is a sign-up sheet um, at the connection table. If you're interested in that, um, I know that he'll want to be able to set up tables for that. So we'll need to know how many to sign, uh, set up for. So mark your calendars and make sure to sign up. And then April 28th, Sunday, April 28th at 5 p.m., we are going to have our first annual Passover Seder. This is going to be super exciting. Space is limited. So I'm going to say do not leave here without signing up for this because once the spots are filled, there's no more room. So you're going to want to make sure that you sign up for this. There is a sign up sheet in the back. They're set up by tables and there's seven spots per table. So make sure you sign up for a table and like Pastor Bob and Heather, make sure you sign up for the same table. So don't sign up for seven, eight because you won't get to sit unless you don't want to sit together, but I can't imagine that. So uh, make sure you sign up for the table that you'll be at. And just an announcement. I don't know who knows us, but um, we have an amazing woman, Don Gonda. She leads our fishes and loaves ministry. And what this is, is if there is someone that might be sick or um, might have just had a baby or there's some situation where they might need some meals, Don gets us all together and she sends out this amazing um email that says, hey, can you bring a meal to so-and-so? So this is for people within the church that we bring meals to. If you're interested in participating in that, mark on your connection card and Don will get you on the email list because this does happen periodically and it's funny how sometimes you don't have it for a long time and then all of a sudden you have it a lot. So um, make sure that if you're willing to bring a meal to someone to uh, sign up for that. Tithes and offerings. This is just a time where we continue with our worship of giving back to God a portion of what he's already blessed us with. Everything that we have is his, and so we just act in obedience of giving back to him. So I'm going to pray for that right now. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you and praise you for this day. Thank you and praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you would put on the hearts of each one of your believers what it is that you would have them to give today. Lord, we ask that you would bless this offering, that it would be a sweet aroma to you. And Lord, I pray for the leadership of this church, that you would give them great wisdom in how to use these resources to grow your kingdom for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, listen, before we, um, before we continue on really quick, um, <clears throat> just something I want to throw your way. For those of you who don't know, my name is Pastor Billy. I'm the senior pastor here. I'm usually the guy in the pulpit today. I will not be, which is cool. I get a break, and Pastor Bob will be up in just a minute. But what I wanted to just bring to your attention is if you are all not, let me put it this way, if you are not already doing something, because here's what happens. We have, you have a core group of people, and when there's a need, they just step up and do it. And then that core group of people never gets to church because they're always helping. So what we're asking for is if you're, if you're not already involved in something, we have, we have two areas of need that we could really use some help if you're interested. One would be the coffee ministry, which you have to come a little bit early, set up the coffee, and make sure that that's ready for the day. So if that's, that's hospitality. So if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet in the back for both of these. If that's something you're willing to do, and again, you've got to come a little bit early. It's not like you don't just show up at 10 and go, oh, I should probably make some coffee. You can't do that. You have to be here a little bit early. So if that's you, if you're interested in that, it's something you can do, please sign up for that. And then kids ministry. There's not a lot that's expected of you. We have teachers. Right now, we're just looking for people as assistants to help out. One thing that we've always been very careful of since the beginning, we never, ever, ever put adults with kids alone, like one adult and a bunch of kids. Never. We always have at least two adults. That way, there's never any problems. So what we need is we need a couple more that people that are willing as adults to step up to just be, not in the nursery, you don't have to change di uh, diapers or anything like that, um, but just for the little bit older kids to be there to assist the teachers, like pass out things and help the kids with stuff and, and, and whatever it is that they need you to do. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to go to the back. There's one sign-up sheet for both of these. Just put your name down and your, uh, like your email address or however it is you want us to contact you. And, and I just want you to pray about that. After service, instead of just running out real quick, Please just pray about that. There's so many things I want you to check out on that back table. With that being said, do you, you want me to leave this up here for you? Okay. With that being said, 
Guys, I'm going to sit down and shut up for this week, which is awesome. And our associate pastor of men in evangelism, Pastor Bob, will be up. So give it up for Pastor Bob and the kids. You can go with Miss Brenda. Good morning. Grace and peace from God our Father and Jesus our Lord and Savior be with you. You know, I said a little something different when I was uh, welcoming people this morning, only because in Jude we're going to see a little something different. Um, and I was a little out of sorts up here at the, uh, at the welcome, only because I'm, I've been so focused on, on what I'm going to share on today that I was kind of like thinking about different things, and I'm like, oh, i got to do the welcome. So uh, if I felt a little, if it looked a little or it sounded a little disjointed, it probably was. Um, uh, as always, I'm, I'm always honored and humbled when Pastor Billy asks me occasionally to get on the pulpit, and I'm very glad to do it. Uh, I'm honored, and uh, I'm glad that Pastor Billy occasionally gets a chance to kind of sit and relax and hopefully even get a little something from the, what I, I get to share. Um, believe it or not, it's a lot of work to put together a sermon. It really is. And for a guy that only does it every once in a while, it's, it's even more work. But it was, I had a good week. Um, oftentimes, and, and Pastor Billy or Larry or anybody else that steps on the pulpit will tell you, occasionally when you're going to uh, <clears throat> preach or teach to the congregation, there's attacks that come. But thankfully, I'm about uh, 21 days away from retiring, and I'm kind of like, and, and I'm taking time at the office to do things that I normally wouldn't do. So I had a lot of, a lot of study time this week at the office. Uh, and uh, we're going to be in the book of Jude this morning, okay? And at the end, hopefully I'll be able to share with you kind of why I picked the book of Jude. And it's interesting because usually when I, I'm going to preach, Pastor Billy will usually text me on Monday, what's the title of your sermon? And I don't, I'm thinking, I'm working on it. And then on Tuesday, what's the title of your sermon? I got to get the bulletin together. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll have something for you soon. And then on Wednesday, he says, I got to have the title of your sermon. I'm putting together the bulletin today. And... Uh, but I told him a week or so ago that I says, I think I'm going to be preaching on June. Monday, no text. Tuesday, no text. Wednesday, no text. I'm like, what, you don't want to know the title? Well, there's really only, when, you're, when you say the book of Jude, there's only one thing that comes across, and that is contending for the faith, which is what I was going to call it. He already knew that, but that's pretty much, when you, when you talk about the book of Jude, or the epistle of Jude, it's pretty much always the uh, contending for the faith. So uh, before we uh, get going, let's uh, all please stand, if you can, to, uh, we'll read a few verses of Jude um, here. It says, Jude, uh-oh, oh. Uh -oh. okay. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I made an effort to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt it necessary to write and urge you to contend earnestly for the faith entrusted once for all of the saints. For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. They turned the grace of our God into a license for immorality and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity today to share a little bit about these scriptures. Father, I just pray that what I have to share today will, will touch hearts and change lives and Give us a vision for what we need to be doing each and every day as your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So this is going to be a very different um, teaching for me. Only because one day I woke up, and you may have gone through this. You woke up and found out, I'm not doing some of the things that I always did that were beneficial for me that helped me grow, that kept me healthy, things like that, you know? Like, 
getting on the treadmill maybe and putting in a 20, 30 minute uh, you know, workout on the treadmill. All of a sudden you miss one day and it's like, ah, it's only one day. And then the next day you say, well, maybe I'll get back to it on Monday. And then a month goes by and then two months goes by. And you say, well, I really don't need to get on the treadmill. Well, the way I was discipled by, and I refer to him often, Pastor Steve, was how to hermeneutically approach the scriptures. Not just for teaching, because that was never really any of my intention or my thought that any one day I'd be on the pulpit teaching the word, but for personal Bible study, for personal gain, for personal growth. He was teaching me hermeneutical principles, which is primarily go back to the original text, back to the Greek, and find out what the Greek words meant. Find out what the author was right, who he was writing to, and what he was trying to convey to the original audience. Look and see what other authors may say about the very same subject, as well as how does this apply to our lives today. All these things go in with the hermeneutical exegesis of um, of text, um, and I primarily did it for my own personal life. And I would literally sometimes take three, four hours studying a couple scriptures because there's a lot of in-depth study and going to the original Greek and then going to your tools and finding, you know, Greek lexicons and, and Greek word studies and things like that. It's a whole lot easier today with something like this or a computer. I've literally got books and books and books that I have to run from page to page to page. And now with my eyesight not as good as it was, I got a magnifying glass and I'm trying to look at that little tiny text and read what it says. Um, so it's a whole lot easier to be able to bring things up on a computer today than uh, when I originally started studying the scriptures. Um, so we're going to kind of look intently, primarily at the Greek of this text to dig out sort of the deeper, deeper more amplified meaning of what Jude is saying here. We're only going to get through a few a few um, uh, verses here. Uh, I mean, so, in fact, when you go to Jude, all you have to do is go to Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And as we talked about yesterday in men's group, go to your left, and Jude will be one, maybe two pages, because it's only it's it's really just a one chapter book. Uh, and uh, so we're going to go through a couple verses here. And oftentimes when we're reading something like this, we're going to quickly go through this introduction as we read it. We're going to, boom, just read through the introduction, never even think about it. Um, but when we look up there, what do we see? We say, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept in Jesus Christ. If you just read through that and go on to verse 2, and don't think about that, don't dig into it, you miss a whole lot of what he's saying here. He says, we know that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, and we call him the half-brother of Jesus because they had the same mother, but they didn't have the same father, right? Jude, who was his father? Joseph. Jesus, who was his father? God. So they had the same mother, but they, they have different fathers, and so therefore they're half-brothers. But notice how Jude starts out here. He identifies himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. Now, Pastor Billy's taught much Greek from the pulpit before. And when you hear the word servant, is there any particular word that comes to mind? You know that. But, but what's, the more, what's the more common word that comes across? No, I'm thinking of diakonos. Most of the time when we think servant, we're thinking diakonos which is where we get our word deacon. This word in the Greek is doulos. Totally different than diakonos. Doulos is the um, most strongest word for slave that you're going to find in the Bible. So yeah, he, we interpret it servant, like a deacon, but if that's what you're thinking, you're missing it. He identifies him as a servant. He, he could have, but he, he could have really built up his reputation here. He says, hey, I'm Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, and you guys really need to listen to me. 
because I'm an awesome guy. I grew up with Jesus as my big brother. And now I'm, in, I'm teaching and uh, talking to the, to, to the church. But no, he says he is a servant. The doulos in the Greek. Again, it's the most abject term for slave in, the, in all the New Testament. It depicts one who lives his life entirely to do the will of his master. He's sold out, lock, stock, and barrel to do exclusively anything he is asked to do by his master. And here Jude says, I live solely to do the will of Jesus and to fulfill his desires, whatever they are. Now, I, I, I'm, that, that's tough for a younger brother to think that about his older brother. But he knows in whom He's put his trust. He says, my job is faithfully to faithfully execute the assignments that Jesus has given to me. And that's really what we should be saying about ourselves. We should be saying, I am living to faithfully do the things that Jesus calls and tells me to do. Yes, we're sons and daughters of God. There's no doubt about that. And that in itself is a great privilege. But in attitude... We should be looking at ourselves as servants of God. To do anything that Jesus would ever ask us to do. I know that my wife and I, Heather, um, we, we try to live our lives that way. And we try to teach our children to do that. And now, hopefully, we'll get a chance to teach our grandchildren to do that. Yes, we're sons and daughters, but in practice... We're servants of God. That's why we are here. We're here to fulfill His will for our lives. How often do you pray? Not my will, but your will, God. And then we go do our own thing. Many are His sons, but they don't obey Him. They're sons, but they're not servants. We need to aim in our hearts to be servants of Jesus Christ. Just like Jude, the younger brother of Jesus, says, and wrote about himself. Then he goes on to identify himself, what? As the brother of James. The word for brother in the Greek here is Adelphos, which describes him as the natural brother of James. So we know that Jesus was the half-brother of Jude and also the half-brother of James, who also has a, a book in the Bible. And then he adds, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. Well, that's what the G King James says. The Greek says something a little bit different. And this is very important. It says to them that are in God. So when you go to the original text, it talks about being in God. And that word in in the Greek, it's a very small, it's a preposition. Spelt E-N. Pronounced N. And here it means to those that are deeply embedded in God... And it describes our position in Christ. When we made Jesus Lord of our life, not only did he come into our hearts, but we were placed in Christ. And we are deeply embedded inside God the Father. That, that should blow you away. That we are in Christ. Yes, he's come into our lives. He's come into our hearts. But we are in Christ and we are embedded in God the Father. And the King James says, sanctified by God the Father. But actually the Greek says, having been loved. And having been loved is a form of the word, Pastor Billy shares on it often, agape. The word agape, which Pastor Billy has talked about so often, is a marvelous, incredible word. Listen to this. This is out of some of my Greek studies. It says, Agape is a divine love that gives and gives and gives, even if it's never responded to, never thanked, or never acknowledged. A love that causes a viewer to behold an object or person in esteem, in awe, admiration, appreciation, and awakens such great respect in the heart of the observer for the person being beheld that he's compelled to love it and do something for it. 
That's our Jesus. That's our God. He loves us so much. Whether we respond to it, whether we acknowledge it, whether we thank him, he is looking at us with that great love and wants to do something for you. What's the most famous scripture with the word love in there? It's, well, obviously, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That word, that word so is very important in there. It dramatizes how great the love of God was. So when God looked upon the world, it caused such an awe and admiration to come out of his heart that he couldn't just look at the world and pity it for its condition it was in, but his love compelled him to do something on behalf of the world. And now Jude uses the same word to tell us we have been loved. God's love for us is nearly indescribable and inexpressible. Then he says we are preserved by Jesus Christ. The word preserved is actually a form of the Greek word tereo. And the word tereo means to be guarded, to be kept, to be preserved, and be protected. It's the very word that was used to describe a soldier which had been assigned to watch over a particular piece of property. He was going to guard that property, preserve that property. He was going to protect that property because that was his assignment. But the word terreo is also the word that's used to describe uninterrupted vigilance of a shepherd who was assigned to watch over the flock. He was not going to take his eyes off of those sheep because those sheep were his assignment. He would guard them and he would protect them. And now this word is being used to describe how Jesus is watching over me and he's watching over you. Church, Jesus is watching over you. Every moment of every day. You're his territory. You're his child. And like a soldier, he's watching over you. Like a shepherd, he's making sure you're all right. And then Jude goes on to say that we are called. And the word called really describes a VIP invitation that is extended to very special people, which means you're a child of God and that you're something special. Jesus extended his VIP invitation to you and you could have never come to salvation unless that salvation invitation had been given to you by the Holy Spirit. The word called is from the Greek word kletos, which means to beckon, to call, to invite, or to summon. Now listen, it was often used to convey the idea that those called or invited to an event that was normally closed to the public, thus an event that one could only participate in with a VI invitation that's how special you are to God so those who receive such an invitation should view it as a privilege a prestigious honor to be treasured to be prized and to be revered it's an honor to be among those that are called isn't that amazing you've been called by God you were given a VIP invitation to become his son or his daughter. Is your mind blown yet? <laughs> so when we read verse 1, look it up there, and then listen to this. I am Jude, first and foremost, a completely sold out, committed, lifelong servant of Jesus Christ. And as is true with all such servants, that means I now live solely to do his will and to faithfully carry out any assignment he will ever entrust to me. I'm also the natural born brother of James. But in this letter, I'm writing to those that, who are in God the Father, to those who are deeply embedded inside him, having experienced the inexpressible, indescribable, unspeakable love of God. I'm talking about privileged people, 
that Jesus Christ has personally extended his VIP invitation to, and having accepted that invitation, are now guarded, kept, preserved, and protected by Jesus Christ himself. Who, like a great soldier faithfully watching over an assignment, or like a shepherd who watches over his flock, he is faithfully guarding and keeping watch over each and every one who is under, under his uninterrupted care. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Come on. Is that awesome? That's all verse 1. That's it. That's... But you would read it and you'd go zoop, right on the verse 2. Never think about it. Never think about being a servant. Never thinking about who Judas. Never thinking about being kept or called or invited. See, this is how I was taught to study the scriptures. It takes a lot of time. It takes literally hours sometimes to study one verse. But it's so worth it. So, so worth it. Folks, Jesus has his eye on you every moment of every day. Now, verse 2, it's a very small verse, which I kind of blew this morning in my introduction. It says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. I oftentimes get up and I kind of repeat something that Paul says in, his, in his, a lot of his letters. It says, grace and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior be with you. That's how Paul starts a lot of his letters. Here, Jude does something similar. He says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. We're going to dig into this one too. It can be translated, the word mercy in the Greek is ilios. Yes? Ilios? Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. You can answer if I ask. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> it can be translated as the word compassion or even the word pity. It means compassion be to you. It means a compassion to do something for someone else. To see them in their need, to see them in their plight, and it's a compassion or a mercy that is driven to change that person's situation. That's what it means to have mercy. And Jude here is saying, mercy be to you. And I want it multiplied in your life. Then we come to the, pe the word peace. Irene, which is the Greek equivalent of the word we've always hear, shalom, exactly. Um, the word peace depicts the cessation of war, an end to a conflict, a time of rebuilding and reconstruction after war has ceased. Distractions are removed. It depicts a time of prosperity, the rule of order in place of chaos. It's a calm inner stability that results in the ability to conduct oneself peacefully even in the midst of circumstances that would normally be traumatic or upsetting. That's the kind of peace God's extending to you and to me. And then he adds love. Mercy unto you, peace and love. And again, that's the word, Greek word agape, which we already talked a little bit about describes the inexpressible, indescribable, marvelous love of God. And he says, my prayer is that it be multiplied to you. All three of those, mercy, peace, and love, be multiplied. That's from the, multiplied is from the Greek word plethuno, which means to amplify, to make full, to increase, to maximize, or to rapidly escalate. Don't you want rapidly escalating the love of God in your life? The rapidly escalating mercy of God in your life? An increase of peace in your life? Multiplied day after day? So if you're to translate all of this fully the way it reads in the Greek, here it is. Mercy to you, a mercy that compels God to act on your behalf, and peace be to you, a peace that brings sensation to the wars in your life. Closure to conflict. Removes distractions. Allows for a time of rebuilding and reconstruction. 
ushers in prosperity, fosters the rule of order in the place of chaos, and brings a peace that produces a calm. Inner stability that results in the ability to conduct, conduct yourself peacefully, even in the midst of circumstances that would normally be traumatic or upsetting. And I wish for God's love to be multiplied in your life, that this love of God would escalate and abundantly multiply in your life. That's what Jude is saying by saying, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. But again, we would just read through that short verse and just go on, never thinking about mercy or peace or God's love. When we get to Jude verse 3, he starts off saying, Beloved. This verse is really jam-packed, and we're going to try and take it apart here and go through it, but let's look at that first word, beloved. Do I have it up there? Yeah, beloved. In the Greek, it's agapatoi. Agapatoi. It's from the... the it's again, it, it, it's a form of the word agape, used to describe the indescribable, unspeakable, wonderful love of God. Then he says, when I give all diligence to write unto you, gave all diligence is a form of the Greek word spadazo. I love saying these Greek words. I've actually learned how to pronounce them. Uh, spadazo. Listen to this. The word spadazo means to do something with eagerness, to do something with diligence, acting responsibly, quickly and with attentiveness, or one so diligent, excited, and energetic that he puts his whole heart into what he's about to do. That's what Jude is saying, man. I am so excited. I can't wait to write this letter. I'm, man, I am just overjoyed with the opportunity here to talk to you people through this letter. It means to do something with excitement, enthusiasm, and haste because it's so important, serious, and urgent. To give one's best efforts to a project or a task and to do it enthusiastically. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because it means Jude was very, very excited. He's going to be writing a letter and he's going to write to those readers about what? Common salvation. That's oh yeah, it's up there. About the salvation we share, about common salvation. And that word in Greek is koinos. You may have heard of koinonia, which is where we come together for fellowship and we share with one another. Time, oftentimes breaking bread together and stuff. Well, he's talking about shared salvation here. Koinos. The word koinos describes something that is mutually shared. It's the word that was used to describe property that was mutually shared between a husband and a wife. They both had rights to the very same piece of property. So that word common describes something that is mutually shared by me and it's mutually shared by you. And he's talking about the benefits of salvation. We have mutually shared benefits of salvation. Now, if you've been here for the last few weeks, you notice on the front of the bulletin the, the word sozo, and Pastor Billy's shared about that. Salvation is a form of the Greek soterion. Sozo, to be saved. That's part of the whole message that's been coming forth for the last month or so which describes salvation, deliverance, healing, and it carries the idea of prosperity, preservation, safety, or even general welfare. And Jude was so excited about writing this letter about mutually shared benefits of salvation because it was his half-brother Jesus who died on the cross as the Lamb of God to provide all these mutual benefits for us. He was so excited that he used the Greek word spadazo, which means he was eager, he was excited, he was enthusiastic, and he could hardly wait to get this letter out to you. He says, I was going to write you about everything that our salvation entails. 
all of our mutually shared benefits. And then he says, but. But it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. So he takes a right turn. He says, I'm going to share with you all these great benefits of salvation, all the things that we mutually share that my older brother Jesus, when he died on the cross as the Lamb of God, provided for each and every one of us believers. But I now find it necessary to change directions here. The word needful is a translation of the Greek word anagke. Listen to what this means. It denotes an urgent necessity. By using this word, Jude was letting his readers know that he had become aware of something which was so stressful to him that he totally abandons his plans to write an epistle about salvation and decided to address another matter altogether. So he starts off going in one direction, saying, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm so excited. I can't wait. But I just heard about something, and I really need to address it. So what happened? What did he hear? What caused Jude to have this great distress that he gives up this exciting letter that he wants to write to talk about something else? Well, it's generally thought that he read the second Peter letter which was written just shortly before Jude writes this letter. They were written in sometime in the 60s, and I'm not talking about 1960s. I'm talking about the 60s, like 63, 64, 65, 67, somewhere in there in the mid-60s. Peter writes this letter. Jude gets this letter. He reads it. He gets all upset. He starts freaking out, probably. So he got a hold of the second letter of Peter, and when he read 2 Peter chapter 2, Jude was so impacted by what he read that he felt he needed to address the same subject. Jude sees in 2 Peter what's happening in the church, and he scraps his plan to write about the mutually shared benefits of salvation and chooses instead to address that we need to contend for the faith. So what does 2 Peter say? I'm going to read. I got my old King James, my very first Bible that I bought back in 1994 after I got saved. It's, it's very colorful. It's very worn. I actually had to take black, um, what's that stuff called? Black duct tape and put it over there because my cover was falling apart. It's, it's, it's an awesome Bible. Very small print. And King James, so sometimes it's a little hard to read. But let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, the first couple of verses. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies or destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways or their deceptive ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of or exploited or blasphemed. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words or deceitful words make merchandise of you or exploit you whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not or their destruction doesn't sleep. So false teachers are coming into the church. You can continue reading in Second Peter and he goes on to continue to talk about that but, but these men who have secretly come into the church are beginning to abuse the church with false doctrine and to make merchandise or exploit the people of God. When Jude read that and everything else in 2 Peter, he basically says, you know what? I can't write about the mutual benefits of salvation. I've got to address this. 
Primarily, he was writing, I believe, to the churches of Asia Minor. I'm not sure exactly what churches those were. My geography isn't great. Pastor Billy, I'm sure, knows. And, but he scraps his plan to write the letter he was so excited about and found it needful for, to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. That word exhort is a form of the word parakaleo. It's a military term. It can mean urge, beseech, beg, or encourage. A word which was used by, generally by commanders in the army who spoke to their troops, told them to hold their heads high, throw their shoulders back, and look the enemy eyeball to eyeball in the face. He says, you're going into battle. It's going to be a bloody battle. It's going to be a nasty fight. But hold your heads high. Put your shoulders back and march in there and fight. That's what he's doing when he's exhorting, when he's parakaleo to his, to his uh, um, people. A word which was used by commanders to speak to their troops. He would exhort them to march into the battle. And the very fact that Jude uses this word meant as a general in the faith, who he was, he needed to charge the troops and tell them it was time for them to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And it's interesting that that phrase earnestly contend in the Greek is actually a compound word. It's ep agonizomai. Now that's a mouthful. Ep agonizomai. Ep is a contraction of the word epi which means over and here it's used as an intensifier. And the word agonizomai is where we get the word agony from. When you put these two words together, it means to earnestly agonize over something. It portrays literally two wrestlers who agonize to win over the other in a wrestling match. And in this particular verse, it pictures those who are fighting over the faith. And when I read that, I was thinking of Hulk Hogan and somebody in a wrestling match today, you know, ready to go at each other, agonizing over, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail you. I'm going to, you know, throw you down and pin you. But that's, that's what he's saying here. He's, he's saying, this is how we have to fight. We have to go in there and fight for the faith. And here's what we find. False teachers were trying to change and modify the message of the gospel. And now Jude speaks as a commander and he says, guys, throw your shoulders back, lift your heads up. It's time to march into the war and agonize, fight over the truth because the faith is under assault. He says, earnestly contend for the faith. Now we have faith. We have, when we pray, we have faith that God's going to answer our prayers. We have faith for healing. We have faith for a lot of things. That's not the faith he's talking about. He's talking about the faith that was given to us. The faith has a defined article, and it means the faith or pistos that Pastor Billy's talked about many times. Not personal faith, but the faith that comes to us. It refers to doctrine or to the long-held, time-tested, sound teachings of Scripture. False teachers were trying to wrestle over the truth, and they were trying to wrestle away from those who have it and replace it with modifications. Sound familiar? Maybe 2023, 2024, we can see some of that going on. So, I think it's Solomon who said, there's nothing new under the sun. What was happening in 65 is happening in 2024. The same exact thing. So this letter is so pertinent to us today. We need to rise up, get into the battle, and fight for our faith. I'm getting ahead of myself. They were trying to take down the truth and introduce error into the church. And Jude says, get on in the fight. Go win the fight. Give it everything you've got. Don't let them take the truth from you. He says, the faith that once for all was delivered to the saints. Once for all is the word hapax. 
Apex, H-A-P-A-X. It means once for all, the idea of completion, finality. Something so complete that it needs nothing more to be added to it. The false teachers were trying to modify the truth because they didn't like the truth. How many people do you run into out there or see on TV or hear giving speech? Don't like the truth. They want to change the truth. They want to modify the truth. Because why? Because the truth is inconvenient to their life. Brings conviction. They know they're wrong. They want to change it so they're right. They want to create a new gospel that would be more palatable to unbelievers. Something that was more inclusive. Interesting word. That everyone could participate in, but it wasn't the truth. They were just making a new gospel. Jude says, what don't you understand? The word of God has been given to you, hapax, once for all, complete, final. No need for modification, no need for alteration, no need to amend the truth. The truth has been given to you in total, in fullness, and that's it. Nothing to be added or changed. He finishes by saying, which was delivered unto the saints. The word delivered in the Greek is paradidomai. Love saying that one. Paradidomai, which means to deliver over to someone, to entrust to someone for safekeeping, to hand something down from one generation to the next, similar to, to traditions that are passed from one generation to the next in a family. Now, I'm a big traditions guy in family. I make the stuffing recipe on Thanksgiving that my mother got from my grandmother that got from my great-grandmother. Exactly the way it's written. In my own mom's personal handwriting, I have a copy of it, and I follow it. I love traditions. My mom and dad had many family traditions. Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, so many different things. Even our birthday song is a tradition birthday song that nobody else sings but our family. At least I, don't, I would think not, but it's about eight verses long. Uh, nine verses, ten, I don't know. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And when we're, when we're with strangers, they're looking like, what the heck are these people doing? You know? Um, but it's our family tradition and we uphold and pass on that tradition year after year generation after generation i'm sure my children and my great grand my grandchildren my great grandchildren will be singing that same birthday song many years down the road my son is going to learn this thanksgiving how to do how to make the family tradition stuffing recipe because I am passing it down to him this year, and he's going to start taking over doing Thanksgiving. But that's what the Word of God is. That's what the faith is. It's been given to us. It's been entrusted to us to pass it, pass it on unchanged, unamended, unmodified, exactly the way it was given to us. We are to pass it on to the next generation. <clears throat> And here's what it means. The word of God was given to us, and just like a family passes a tradition from one generation to the next, we have been entrusted by God with the responsibility to take the word of God that has been once for all given to us and pass it on to the next generation. We're to pass it like a tradition without making amendments or modifications along the way. Our job is to know the Bible and to pass it in its purest form possible to the next generation. That's your charge. Is to know the Bible and to pass it on to the next generation. And raise them up to do the same. I chose this section of scripture because of what's going on in our culture today. We don't change the truth for the culture. We change the culture with the truth. Are you doing that? Are you changing the culture with the truth 
of the Word of God. That's what you do when you walk out that door. You hold your head high, you throw your shoulders back, you look at people eyeball to eyeball, and you tell them, I know the truth. This is the truth. I'm not falling for your deception. I'm not listening to your falsehoods. I'm not modifying things. They say, well, Christians are narrow-minded. Thank God we are. Because we are focused on one thing, and that's the truth of God. Wide is the path to destruction. Narrow is our path. In fact, it's so narrow, sometimes I think it's a tightrope that I have to slowly and carefully walk so I don't fall one way or the other. What happens when you fall off the, go off the road? You go into a ditch, right? What's a ditch? It's a coffin with both ends kicked out. That's not where I want to spend my life. I want to spend my life learning and knowing and passing on the truth of God and standing and fighting for the truth. Hopefully, what I've shared this morning stirs that up in each and every one of you. So that when you walk out this door today, say, darn it, I know the truth and I'm not going to let anybody push me off the truth. I'm going to stand for the truth. It's gonna, you're going to get persecuted. You're going to get talked down. You might get fired if you stand up at work some places. I know I've been told a few times to tone it down. Didn't do much good. I figure after 44 years, if they want to fire me, go ahead and fire me. I might have an age discrimination case. <laughs> but, but no, I, I joke, but we need to be bold. We need to stand up to what's happening in this culture. Because every single day, the church is being attacked. Not like it is in some parts of the world where they're chopping off heads or throwing you in prison for the rest of your life. That may come. That may be the America of the future. But we can do something about it right now. We can stand up. We can defend the faith. The first thing is to know the truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. And no matter what persecution comes, no matter what comes against you, Jesus is watching over you. He's caring about you. He'll bring you through it. Many of the songs today were about battles. And we know that no matter what battle we face, we are going to be victorious. It might take a little time, but our battle's going to, we're going to be victorious. Hey, I've overcome cancer. That's in my past. I've overcome COVID in my past. I overcame a, whatever the heart thing was that I got. It's in my past. I have victory over everything the enemy has thrown against me. And I'll go to my grave believing that whatever comes, I have victory over it before I even have to face it. So let's go to battle. Let's lift our heads, put our shoulders back, look at the enemy eye to eye and tell him, this is the truth and I'm not swaying from it. I'm sticking to it. Amen? Well, thank you so much for your attention today. Hopefully, this stirred a little something in you. And I just pray, Father, I just ask that your mercy and your peace and your love would be multiplied to everyone here. Father, that they would raise up and take their place on the, on the war, on the front, to defend the truth. And the, pass the truth on to the next generation and the generation after that. Father, I ask your hand of blessing be upon each and every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you guys give it up for Pastor Bob? Woo! Fuego, fuego, fuego! <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much. Dude, that was, I love it. I'm weird, though. I like all that stuff. So thank you. That was great. So even if everybody else fell asleep, I loved it. So that was good.
All right, guys. So um, thank you for coming. I'll be back in the pulpit next week, but I'm so grateful for you bringing that message today. Thank you for that. Guys, do me a favor. Make sure that you reach out to people that you see missing. There's still people that are sick. There's still people that are at home that need a touch. Try to make some connections this week. And guys, we love you, and we will see you guys next Sunday.